I want to preach this morning about giving God praise before your deliverance. Giving God praise before your deliverance. Three elements conspire in the making of every great message. Three elements conspire in the making of every great message. There's a pulpit, there's an audience, and there's a truth. These three were present in the most notable messages in the life of our blessed Savior, his Sermon on the Mount, and his seven last words from the cross. The pulpit for the Sermon on the Mount was the mountainside. His audience were unlettered Galileans. His truth were the Beatitudes. The pulpit for his seven last words was the cross. His audience were scribes and Pharisees who blasphemed, temple priests who ridiculed, Roman soldiers who gambled, Timid disciples who ran, Mary Magdalene who wept, John the disciple who loved, and Mary his mother who grieved as only a mother can. His truth was the seven last words, the dying words of a savior who by dying slew death. In our text this morning, three elements conspire in the making of a great message. A pulpit, an audience, and the truth. Job's pulpit is his bed of affliction. Job's audience are those of us who wonder where is God in the midst of my suffering. His truth is the assurance that God in Christ will be with us through every season of trial and testing. Brothers and sisters, those of us who are serious students of the Bible know that there are hard questions in the book of Job. And there are two ways to ask these questions. And I need you to think with me for a moment. There are hard questions in the book of Job. And there are two ways to ask these questions. You can ask the question as an armchair believer or as a wheelchair believer. An armchair believer is like an armchair quarterback. You're not in the game. You're sitting in your recliner saying what you would have done if you were in the game. And anybody can quarterback from their living room. Anybody can remonstrate about suffering if you haven't suffered. Anybody can give you advice on how you ought to handle suffering if you've never been wounded. But wheelchair believers talk about not what they heard, but what they know from their own personal experience. 
Somebody here has been through storms and trials and testing and heartbreak and God has brought you through and you don't have an armchair testimony. You got a wheelchair testimony. I know what prayer can do. I know God is a healer. I know God will be a mother for you. I know God will put food on your table. Not from armchair experience. I'm a wheelchair believer. Yeah. Listen, listen. Armchair questions are electives. Armchair questions are extracurricular activity. But wheelchair questions are required courses for academic credit in the school of hard knocks. An overview of the book of Job will uh, hurriedly suggest that while Job mistakenly but understandably uh, Job assumed that God had put him on trial. It is really God and God's policies towards our poor humanity that's really on trial in the book of Job. Job is just a key witness for the defense. And Satan comes with a prosecution. And the overriding evidence being whatever existence and agency evil has in the world has to come by God's permission. Now brothers and sisters hear me. You, you, you have to know something about the book of Job to shout in this message this morning. Because in Job chapter 1 verse number 8 and, and, and preceding and succeeding verses uh, Job is bragged on by God. And while God is bragging on Job, the sons of God present themselves and Satan is in their midst. The Satan, the accuser of the brethren, Satan presents himself with the sons of God. And God says to Satan, essentially, since you don't have anything to do, since you hanging around in the wrong crowd, have you considered my servant, Job? Satan does not introduce Job to the conversation. God introduces Job to the conversation. Listen. Because God will not send you a test he know you can't pass. Every test, every trial is tailor-made for the person who is going through it. God is not capricious. God is not untrustworthy. God will not send you a test or a trial that he does not know you have the wherewithal to pass. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you're a Christian, it's an open book test. And uh, you got to be mighty slow to fail an open book test. Because the answer is in the book. No good thing will I withhold from him who walks uprightly. 
trust in the Lord. That's the answer right there in the book. With all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. He shall direct your path. The answer is in the book. If you run with the footmen, and they have wearied you, how shall you contend with horses? If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. The answer is in the book. There are only four people other than Jesus and Job that God bragged on in the scripture. There are only four people other than Jesus and Job that God said of Job especially, there is none like him in the earth. The only men other than Jesus and Job is Solomon, Hezekiah, Josiah, and Saul. Now you wouldn't think Saul would be in that crowd. <laughs> but the Bible says Saul was head and shoulders above everybody in the kingdom. Solomon, Hezekiah, Josiah, Jesus, and Job are the only people God says there's none like them in all the earth. Let me see if I can help somebody this morning. Sometimes God puts you in a class that does not look like your calling. Sometimes God puts you in a situation, in a classroom, that does not look like your calling. Watch this. Because he is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. And God may want you in class 103B, but you're trying to go to 103A. You're in the wrong class. That's why when blessings come to you that you're not ready for, you mess them up. You've got to go through something before God can put something in your hand. You've got to be under somebody before God can put you over somebody. God wants to prove in us that we love him for no reason external to himself. The Trappist monk Thomas Merton said, if one loves God for something less than God himself, we run the risk of hating God if we don't get what we hope for. Beloved, faith is not getting from God what you want. It's accepting from God what he sends. Faith is not getting from God what we want. It is accepting from God what he gives. Job was the richest man in the East. There was nobody like Job. The Bible says he, he, he feared God and he ran away from evil. Job had seven sons and three daughters. He had yoke of oxen and camels and livestock, a beautiful wife, an extraordinary life. Everything that a man could desire, Job had it. And he lost it all in one fell swoop. He lost all his sheep. He lost all his oxen. He lost all his camel. And while the messengers were coming to tell him about everything that happened to his livestock, another messenger came and said, they were having a party at your oldest boy's house. And a storm blew up. Tore up the house. Killed all your children. I am the only one alive to bring you the news. 
Job didn't cuss. Job didn't shake his fingers at the heavens. The Bible says he shaved his head, tore off his clothes, which is a sign of deep grief and humility in the Jewish customs of living. He shaved his head, ripped his mantle, and said, Naked came out from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, the Bible says, Job did not charge God foolishly. And after Job passed that test, Satan went back and presented himself with the sons of God. And God said again, have you considered my servant Job? He said, Job is serving you for what you're giving him. Job loves you because of, of what he has. You, you, you've taken that away and he stood that test. But, but Satan says, let's play the skins game. It's right here in the text. Skin for skin. That, that's what Satan says. Skin for skin. You, you took his livestock and his camel and his children. He can have that. He can get some more livestock and camels and children because he's rich. But let me strike him in his body. And I'll make Job curse you to your face. God said, have at it, but do not touch his soul. And brothers and sisters, if you are a child of God, some things just belong to God. God will protect you. God will put a hedge around you. That's what Satan's argument was. Satan says, Job is serving you because you got a fence around him. Move the fence and I'll make him curse you to your face. He's stricken with pus oozing sores, boiled from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. He's out on the ash heap scratching himself with pieces of pot sherd because he's itching and bleeding and pus is oozing all over. And Mrs. Joe says, why don't you curse God and die? Job said, I, you know, I really, I really thought you had some sense. If, 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 if I had known you was this crazy, I never would have married you. I, I really thought you, all this going to church and reading a Sunday school lesson and, and, and singing in the choir and working in children's church and all of this, baking cakes for the women and all, I, I really thought you were a Christian. You, you don't just receive good at God's hand and then when the evil comes, you get mad with God. That's a weak, anemic Christian. Can I help somebody in here? God wants to try you when the storm comes. Because you're not a Christian when the sun is shining. You're a Christian when the doctor says, I got some bad news. You're not a strong Christian when all your children are at church. You're a strong Christian if your boy is in prison and you still come to church. You're not a strong Christian because you got a, a husband and a white picket fence and 2.5 children. You're a Christian when you can come after your divorce. And still give God the glory. You've lost your job, but you're still giving God the glory. Your health is beginning to fail, but you're still giving God the glory. You don't know what tomorrow's gonna look like, but you have learned how to give God praise before your deliverance. Don't wait till the battle is over. Go ahead and shout. Yeah. yeah. We live we live 
with trials and difficulties. In this world, you will have tribulation. And then Job's so-called friend. came to his house and he sat with him seven days but on the eighth day they started giving unsolicited advice they said Joel come on now tell us the truth you, 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 ain't, you ain't going through this for nothing there's got to be some sins in your life that, that God is punishing you for and listen sometimes um, situations are the result of sin but sometimes God lets calamities happen to us just to get glory just, just, just for us to grow and to develop as Christians and once, once God has made that plain to you that your trial has come to make you strong and you come out of the divorce you come out of the sickness and people think something still got to be wrong with you you can't get in church unless people ask you, how you doing I'm fine how you doing well, I know what you've been going through. That ain't none of your business. Get you some business. Get you something to run. Get you something to do. I'm doing fine. Well, I'm praying. Pray for yourself. I don't need you patting me on the back and pacifying. I got Jesus. I don't need a man to validate me. I don't need a relationship to make me somebody. I'm somebody because I'm a child of God. If anybody asks you who I am, tell them I'm a child of God. You know, listen. Folk want you down because that makes them up. They want to make, make, it, make it look like, uh, Carlos uses this word all the time, they want to make like you always doing bad. They want to make like you just suffering and I'm praying for you. No, 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 no boo-boo. I've been delivered. And they can't understand why you look so good. Why you're still dressing good. Why you're still wearing Christian Louboutin. And why you still got Louis Vuitton and you ain't got a man. You got a job. You don't need nobody to take care of you. God will take care of you. Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? God will take care of you. He'll put food on your table. He'll make your enemy your footstool. He'll provide for you. We live in a society That, that, that thrives on more. The billionaire wants more money. The politicians want more power. The child wants more macaroni and cheese. Everybody wants more. But there are very few people in this church who want more spiritually. Because to get more spiritually, you got to suffer.
you got to lose something. To get more spiritually, you got to be rock bottom. And God's got to take from you what you think you can't get along without. To help you to recognize that when you hit rock bottom, he's always been the rock at the bottom. Oh. Job lost everything he had. Everything. And God gave Job every reason to break their relationship. God gave Job every, because, because listen, Satan and God is having this conversation and Job knows nothing about what's going on behind the scene. And the trial you may be going through may be a conversation between God and Satan that has nothing to do with you other than God wants to get glory out of your life. And so he lost, he lost all of his money. He lost all his children. His wife walked out. Everything he had is gone. His friends give him no comfort to the degree that Job says himself, may the day I was born be wiped off the calendar. May it not even be spoken that a man child was conceived. God, he says, why didn't I die in my mother's womb? Read Job when you get a minute. And then he said, God, if you let me live in the womb, why wasn't I born dead? If I have to go through all that I have to go through. And in all of that, Job said, though he slay me, yet will I put my trust in. Man that is born of a woman. Ain't got but a few days. And those few days are full of trouble. He said, hide me in the grave and keep me secret till your wrath be passed. And when you're ready for me, call my name and I will answer to my name. And his friends rake him over the coal. His friends pulling him down, make him feel worse than he felt before. And they got on Job's nerves so bad that he started complaining. Bitterly lamenting. And Job got to the end of his rope and said, Oh, that I, I knew where God was. I, I wish I knew where he was. I'm, I'm not scared to talk to him. I just can't find him. Oh, but I knew where I could find him. I would rise and bring my case before him. If I knew where he was, I'd make a little visit to him this morning. And God let Job holler and rant and rave for 23 chapters. And then around chapter 40, God said, uh, Mr. Joel, I hear you've been looking for me. I understand you want to talk to me. He said, well, before you talk to me, stand up like a man. Gird yourself. Put some clothes on and look like a man if you're going to talk to me. But before you open your mouth to question my sovereignty, let me ask you some questions. Where were you? I wish I had a Bible reader. When the morning stars danced with the evening stars, where were you 
when the sons of God shouted for joy? Why were you when I bulged up hills and mountains and tacked down grass on them and put daffodils and lilies to move the barren landscape of a monotonous world? Why were you? When I made behemoth and Leviathan. Where were you when I stretched the neck of the hippopotamus, or of, the, of the giraffe, and enlarged the belly of the hippopotamus? Where were you when I put noise in a parakeet, flight in a bird, wet in water, girth in land? Where were you when I laid Adam down and took a rib from his side and created a woman and said, this is flesh of your flesh and bone of your bone? Where were you when I told the waters to come so far and no further? And then we get to chapter 42. And Job said, I'm sorry. Such knowledge is too wonderful. I have uttered things that I cannot understand. And brothers and sisters, if you're going to praise God before your deliverance, as I heard, you got to get on the right pathway. Because there was a plan in Job's life that he could not understand, and there's a person in his life that he could not comprehend. He yielded to the Lord even though he didn't understand his ways. He came under God's lordship even though he did not know what God was up to. And your life started out a certain way and you thought you would live it out that way in peace and comfort. But then God sent a tornado. God sent a hurricane in the loss of a loved one or the loss of a marriage or the loss of a job or the loss of just peace of mind. And then God sent all of those things without you knowing that they were coming. Because if you knew they were coming, you could get ready for it. But God sends it right after you have a good shout at church. You get home and all hell is broken loose. So brothers and sisters on that pathway, if somebody's sleeping next to you, wake him up. I'm about to be finished here. On the pathway, you got to pay a price. Job lost his finances, he lost his family, he lost his fitness, and he lost his friends. Because if what you are is tied to what you have, when you lose that stuff, you're going to lose your mind. If what you are is wrapped up in how you look, when you get old, you're going to try to be young. And there's nothing more distasteful than somebody in their 70s trying to look like they're in their 30s. Because all that you are was wrapped up in what you look like. If your money, if your car, if your house, if your shape makes you who you are, when that stuff is gone, you are going to wind up in an insane asylum. But if you know who you are and who you belong to, when your finances are gone, when your fitness is gone, when your family is gone, when your friends are gone, you still have joy. Because you're willing to pay the price. I'm looking at some people in here this morning. 
I know your story. You have suffered greatly. You have stood up under tremendous trials. But you're in here this morning. Still looking good. Still dressing well. Because God has a strange way of putting something in your face that when folk look at you, they can't understand why you still got it like that. Let me, let me, let me cut across the field here. I, I've kept you here too long. Let me, let me, let me cut across. Th there's a pathway. There's a price. But then there's a privilege. Because Job is now before God. And in verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, he's still scratching himself. He's still full of pus oozing boils and sores. God has not delivered him nor given him an answer for his misery. Yet, in verses 1 through 6, he is praising God before he's delivered. And because God sees his faithfulness before Job is delivered, you want to know what God does? I'm glad you asked. God gave Job double everything he lost. Watch this. Except his children. He gave him back everything he lost except his children. Job was blessed at the latter end more than the beginning because he had 7,000 sheep and because he praised God before he was delivered, he now has 14,000 sheep. He had 3,000 camels, now he has 6,000. He had 500 yoke of oxen now he has a thousand. He had 500 she asses. Now, 500, now he has a thousand. But he still got 10 children. God didn't give him 20. God gave him back double what he lost except his children. Somebody ought to help me preach it. And God could have given him 20 children. If God can give you 14,000 camels and 7,000 or 6,000 camels and, and, and 14,000 yoke of oxen, if God can give you all of those things, surely God could have given him 20 children. God gave him 10 children better than the 10 he took. Because when you give your children to God, God will send them back better than you send them to him. Can I shout right here? God gave him back double what he had except his children because everything he had materially, the devil stole from him. But his children, God took them. And when the Lord took them, the Lord had them in safe keeping. And when the Lord sent them back, he gave him seven sons, but he names the three daughters. Girls are never named in the family background. We, we don't know the names of one of Job's sons. Seven sons. We don't know the name of either one of them. But we know the names of his three daughters. Because his three daughters represent how God blessed him at the latter more than at the beginning. 
He gave him a girl named Jemima. Not ain't Jemima, Jemima. The name Jemima means day or dove. God turned darkness into light and turmoil into peace. He gave him another girl named Kazia. That name Kazia means fragrance. God replaced the stench of loss with the sweet fragrance of victory. And then this last girl is named Karen. The name Karen in the scripture means cosmetics or eye paint. The word Karen in the scripture, Job's daughter's name means eye shadow. God gave him a girl who means eye shadow or eye paint. It's the same word in Exodus 32 when Moses came down from the mountain and his face was so bright he had to put a veil on in order for them to be able to look at it. When God blesses your life, he puts a brightness in your countenance and a beauty in your features that when people look at you and know what you've been through, they got to testify you don't look like what you've been through. Stop feeling sorry for me in my trials. Stop brooding over my situation. God has got me. Stop, stop, stop getting on Facebook talking about we need to be in prayer for so and so. No, no, no. Pray for yourself. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. But it ain't everybody I want praying for me. Uh, because the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much. Some people are just nosy and want to be in your affairs and find out what's going on in your life. You need some prayer warriors. Some people who are serious about prayer and they know what prayer can do. But, but I've been walking with God long enough now I can pray for myself. I, I've been standing up under enough pressure long enough now to know that God knows how to deliver. I've gone through enough trials to know God knows how to mend up a broken heart. God knows how to lift up a bow down head. God knows how to raise up some friends for me to encourage me just in the nick of time. God knows how to run off my enemies from me so that I'll be able to do what it is he's called me to do. I need somebody who has been through some trials. I need somebody who has been through some situations with your children or with your marriage or with your health or with your finances. And God has come to your rescue. God has come to your house and God straightened out your situation. You're not in here this morning complaining about anything. You came to give God the glory even before God delivers. You may still be in that situation. You may still be in that trial. You may still be in that circumstance. But you've got enough faith to know God will make a way out of no way. I need a believer this morning. If you trust and never doubt God will bring you out you don't know who you're sitting next to you don't know what that person is going through why don't you come on and help me to encourage them this morning God will see you through God will bring you out God will Answer your prayer. God will come to your rescue. Maybe they don't have enough faith to testify like they should this morning. Why don't you tell them your testimony? I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, 
very deeply stain within I was sinking to rise no more but the master of the sea he heard my despairing cry from the waters he lifted me won't he do it won't he do it why don't you encourage somebody why don't you look at your neighbor you don't know what they had to face last week you don't know what they have to face this week you don't have to put your hands on them just look at them and tell them this be not dismayed whatever be tired God will God will God will take care of you won't he do it won't he do it won't he do it won't he do it say yeah yeah yes yes I know he's a 